So this is the review for the Unit 1 test for Honors Chemistry. Complete these calculations and use the appropriate number of significant figures in your answer. So you need to remember the rules for multiplication and division versus addition and subtraction. So in the first problem, the calculation results in an answer of 60.903 However, because the number that we started with here has three significant figures, I must round to 60.9, and that would be, uh, in this case, it would be centimeters squared. In the second calculation, we end up with 0 0.561, but because, again, we have two significant figures here, our answer must be rounded to 0 0.56. When we have a mixed uh, operation problem like this one, you always take the uh, rule that would give you the least number of significant figures. So whether that's adding or subtracting or multiplying or dividing, round your answer to the smallest number of significant figures based on either rule. So in this case, we subtract and then we divide, and we get an answer of 2.203. The rule for uh, subtraction and addition says that we have to take the smallest number of decimal places, which in this case would result in an answer of 2.2 .2 meters per second. And then the last one is just uh, addition and subtraction, so we're just going to follow the straight rule for that. And when you subtract and add, you end up with 11.36. Again, looking at the number of decimal places, this number has only one decimal, so we must round to 11.4, and that's in milliliters. The distinctions between an element and a compound. There's basically two key distinctions. An element is made of one type of atom only, so it's all gold atoms or all iron atoms. Uh, it's, uh, whoops, type, one type of atom grammar. And then the second is that an element cannot be separated by ordinary chemical means. So you can use a nuclear fission or fusion process to change an atom. Separated uh, by chemical means. A compound has more than one type of atom and can be separated chemically. So those are the distinguishing factors. However you want to say that, those are the things that make the difference between an element and a compound. What is the difference between a pure substance and a mixture? So a pure substance has a consistent composition. That means it's always the same wherever you find it. So if it's a compound, it has the same formula, the same elements in the same proportion, wherever it comes from. H2O is always H2O, never H2O2. That's a different compound. And of course, an element, as we said in the last slide, is one particular type of atom. And it's never, you know, iron atoms never have 72 protons. That would not make it iron. That would make it a different element altogether. And the other distinction, and again, I'm showing you what makes a pure substance. You could express this as what makes something a mixture. It would just basically be the opposite of this. Um, pure substances cannot be separated physically. Okay, so you can separate compounds chemically. You can separate uh, the parts of an atom with uh, nuclear processes, but you cannot separate a compound physically. You can't filter the hydrogen out of water, uh, whereas a mixture can be separated by either filtration or, which we're going to see in the next slide, um, the different physical types of processes that don't change the substances themselves. They just take advantage of their different properties to separate them. Okay, what are three ways that matter can be separated physically uh, using, obviously we're talking about a mixture here. Based on the last slide, you can't separate compounds physically. There are lots of them. Um, just to list a couple here, you need to know three, distillation. The most common ones are probably distillation, filtration, and 
chromatography. Chromatography, okay. Um, distillation takes advantage of different boiling points, which is a physical property. Filtration essentially takes place of uh, takes advantage of the size of the actual particles. And chromatography is a lot like filtration. Um, takes advantage of basically the size of the particles and molecules, which causes some substances to pass through a uh, chromatography medium more quickly than others. So you get uh, pure substances each time you go through the chromatography process if you can uh, run them through at different speeds and trap the fastest ones first, essentially. Um, other methods would be crystallization, sublimation. Uh, depending on the, the characteristics of the substances, you could use magnets. If you have a mixture that's got some uh, magnetic substances and some that are non-magnetic, this is one of the things they do in recycling plants. Right? They filter the, uh, separate the magnetic metals from plastics and aluminum just by running everything under a magnet, and it picks up the metal pieces and the plastic and aluminum goes through. Uh, right? So just any three of those will do. Okay, record the measurements here, and we're talking about measurements, uncertainty, percent uncertainty. Okay, so the measurement is related to the fact that on this ruler, we have markings at the individual centimeters. Okay, that's the units here. Centimeters, and then in between we have markings every tenth of a centimeter. And then it looks like this object is going to fall between these two markings. You always, always, always measure to the markings and then one place beyond. So if the markings go to the tenths, you go to the hundredths. If the markings go to the ones, you go to the tenths, and so on. So in this case, I would record this since it's between 11. It's between 11.6 and 11.7. Right? We're going to record it. And it's the last digit that's an estimate. I'm going to estimate that that is 11.63 three centimeters. You might say it's 11.64. The uncertainty is always plus or minus one unit in the estimated place, so plus or minus one one hundredth. And then the percent is what is your uncertainty divided by the measurement. So we are 0 0.86 percent uncertain, or the other way of saying that is we're approximately 99 percent certain in our measurement. Same type of question, and again we're looking at a ruler uh, in units of centimeters, centimeters, and we've got markings at 1, 1 1.5, and then markings in between, which are going to be the tenths. So we're going to go once again to the hundredths. It is between 1.2 and 1.3. I'm going to call that 1.24 centimeters. So that's what we're going to record as our measurement, 1.24 centimeters. The uncertainty is plus or minus 0.01 centimeters. And the percent is 0.8% again. And the last uh, measurement here, we're in a graduated cylinder that's measuring in milliliters. And we have markings. This time, we don't have the tenths markings. We only have one, so 35, 36. It's in between 36 and 37. So we can record that as 36.4 or 36.5 milliliters. Uncertainty here is plus or minus 0.1 milliliters. And the percent uncertainty is going to be 0. 0.28%. Actually, you would round that to uh, 0.282%. So we have three significant figures in our measurement, 0.282% uncertainty. Okay, some metric conversions, and we're going to use dimensional analysis for these. Uh, and I'm going to break it down into the simplest possible steps, even though that might result in more steps. Uh, there are other ways to do these conversions. But in the first one, we're taking 3.24 times 10 to the fourth kilometers, and we're converting it to centimeters. So there's no direct conversion between kilometers and centimeters, but I can convert kilometers to meters, and then I can convert meters 
to centimeters. And when we multiply all that together, we end up with 3.42 times 10 to the ninth centimeters. Okay, so really all we did there was move the decimal point because we're multiplying by 1,000 and 100. So we're multiplying by powers of 10, and so we are just increasing the power of 10. We didn't really uh, change the number, the coefficient at all. And then the bottom one, we're going from cubic centimeters to cubic meters. So this time, and it's uh, 9.73 times 10 to the negative fifth cubic centimeters. And I'm going to write that as centimeters times centimeters times centimeters. That's what cubes means. So all I have to do to convert that is make the centimeters to meters conversion three times. One meter, 100 centimeters. Do that one more time to cancel out the cubic centimeters. There's 100 centimeters. So now I can cancel out centimeters, 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 centimeters. I multiply across the top, which gives me meters times meters times meters, which gives me the unit I want, which is meters cubed. And so this time I'm dividing by a power of 10. Again, I'm not changing the coefficient at all because I didn't multiply by anything other than 1, and I'm not dividing by anything that's not a power of 10. So I'm really just moving the decimal point around. And what we end up with is 9.73 times 10 to the negative 11th cubic meters. Okay, some dimensional analysis. And um, talked to a couple of you during the review period today. There are different ways to set these up. So if your setup is slightly different from mine, but you get the same answer as I did, then what you're doing is okay. You just have to be careful um, to make sure that all your units line up and that sort of thing. So there's more than one way to, to skin Schrodinger's cat, and this is just the way I would set these up. So you can do it, um, if you did it differently but you got the same answer, then you should be okay. So the first one is converting uh, gasoline cost from dollars per gallon to uh, dollars or money per gram. So we're going to start with, or I'm going to start with, the price per gallon, which is $2.25 per one gallon. And then I'm going to convert gallons to liters. One gallon is 3.78 liters. And then I'm going to convert the um, liters to kilograms, because I was given the density in kilograms per liter. And then I'm going to convert grams, uh, kilograms rather, to grams because I want grams in my final answer. One kilogram is a thousand grams. And so what I end up with when I do this out is seven point seven three. I'm going to write this down here: seven point seven three dollars times ten to the negative fourth per gram, or if you wrote that out, it would be 0 0.000773 dollars per gram. Um, as far as the rounding goes, again, talked to some people during class today, um, this measurement does have two significant figures, so you could make it a case for rounding to 7.7 .7 rather than 7.73. Um, I'm treating this as a conversion factor constant rather than a measured value. Um, so uh, I went with three, but you could certainly make the case for two, and I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't mark you wrong for that. Okay, trying to measure the uh, amount of caffeine in a very large cup of coffee. I chose to start with the amount of coffee in the drink that we're measuring, so 917 milliliters. And then carrying out from there, convert milliliters to liters. 1,000 milliliters is one liter. And then how many uh, fluid ounces that is. One fluid ounce is 0 0.029 liters. 
and there's 18.75 milligrams of caffeine in one fluid ounce. And then we're converting milligrams to kilograms. So two steps here, convert milligrams to grams, 1,000 milligrams in one gram, and then convert grams to kilograms. There's 1,000 grams in one kilogram. We do all that math out, and we find that there are 5.93 times 10 to the negative fourth kilograms of caffeine in one um, large Starbucks coffee. And that doesn't sound like a lot until you realize that um, we're talking about 0 0.00593, which is kilograms, which is half of a gram of caffeine. That's an awful lot of caffeine. 500 milligrams. Okay, how many milliliters of water are there in a fish tank with a given uh, surface area and depth? Really the only thing you have to convert here is the depth in inches to centimeters and then centimeters, uh, cubic centimeters to milliliters, which is the same value, just a different unit. So I just did this in a couple of steps. First I just converted the inches to centimeters and that's 2.54 centimeters per inch, which gives us a depth of 30.48 centimeters times the area of 1,000 square centimeters, which gives us 30,480 cubic centimeters, which is equal to 30,480 milliliters and then uh, just converting that to scientific notation, we get 3.1, since we started with uh, 12 inches, and this time I do count that as measured, 3.1 times 10 to the fourth milliliters. Okay, so the last one is a comparison problem. We're comparing basically the time it would take to fly 100,000 miles on two different uh, airliners with two different speeds. And um, the difference is that the speeds are given to different units. So you just have to basically work this out for each vehicle and then compare the find the difference between the two numbers. So for the first one, for the 777, One hundred thousand miles is the distance, and the uh, converting the miles. Sorry, converting the miles to kilometers. It's point six two miles per kilometer, and the cruising speed is nine hundred thirteen kilometers in one hour, and then convert the hours to seconds because that's what we want our answer in. One hour is 60 minutes, one minute is 60 seconds. So we multiply all that out across the top, divide across the bottom, and we end up with an answer of 635,974.984 seconds. I'm not rounding here because I'm going to save the rounding for the end. Uh, and then the second one, 100,000 miles again, same distance, but this time it says we go 22 and a half miles in one minute, so we don't have as many steps here because we're already in miles and we're going from minutes to seconds instead of hours to seconds, so it saves us a little bit of work. One minute, 60 seconds. When we do that, we get an answer of 266,666.66 repeating. Okay, we find the difference between those and we end up with 3.69 times 
times 10 to the fifth seconds. That's how much time we would save. between the two. So there you go. So those are the types of problems that will be on the test for conversions. And then we're moving on to uh, more matter related questions. Oh, one more on measurements, sorry, accuracy and precision. So these values here were taken as part of three different trials. The question is if the actual uh, accepted value is 2.7, then what is the um, precision or accuracy or both. Well, accuracy refers to how close you are to the accepted value. I would say, given the relative so, uh, small size of this number, a difference of basically one gram per cubic centimeter is almost a third off, so 33 percent or so. So I would say that is not an accurate result. However, precision in the case of repeated measurements means do you get the same answer every time? And in this case, again, given the measurements, I would say that's pretty close. The variation is less than three hundredths of a gram per centi cubic centimeter. So I would say the, the uh, results were precise. They simply weren't accurate. So whatever this person was doing, they made an error at one point in their calculations, it looks like, but they probably did everything else right after that. So that is um, precision, but not accurate. Okay, which of these diagrams represents a compound? Again, difference between an element and a compound. A compound has to have two types of elements, and they must be uh, bonded together chemically in a consistent way. So this is an element. This, it's hard to say, that looks like an element as well because they all have the same shading. This one is a mixture of atoms and molecules of different compounds, so it's not that. This is the only one that has a consistent composition, one black, one white. So that would be answer choice A. A physical versus a chemical change. Remember, physical means it doesn't alter the substance itself, whereas a chemical results in new substances. So burning is always a chemical change. Boiling, any change of state, boiling, freezing, melting, condensation, all of those are physical changes. Rusting is a chemical reaction between metal and air. Cooking an egg changes the chemical composition of the egg itself. Okay, if an object has a mass of 25 grams and floats in water, what must be true? Well, and if it floats in water, that means that it has a density less than one gram per milliliter. And if we know that the uh, mass is 25 grams, that means that the volume must be greater than 25 milliliters in order for the density to be less than one. So it must have a volume larger than 25 milliliters. Which object has the greatest mass? Well, considering D and C are both floating and A and E are on the bottom, we are going to assume that A and E have greater mass than D and C, so then the question is which one is greater? Um, well, A is larger and it has sunk, so I'm going to assume that A has a greater mass than E. Could you uh, make a case that we don't know enough? Maybe, but that wasn't one of the choices. But based on the information here and given the answer choices, A must have a larger mass than E because it sank and it has a greater volume. If B and D have the same mass, what do you think is going to happen when B is dropped in? Well, considering D is just barely floating, if uh, B has the same mass and a smaller volume, it has a greater density, which means it most likely will sink because it's got a greater density than D, and D is just barely floating. Okay, if D and A have the same volume, which one must have the greater mass? Well, D is floating, A sank, which means that A has a higher density, so if they have the same volume, as the question states, then A must have a greater mass, otherwise it would also be floating. If A and D have the same volume, which blocks could have equal mass? So we're looking at these and saying, okay, A and D have the same volume. We know that in that case, A must have a greater mass than D. E probably might have a smaller mass than A. But what about C? Could C and E have the same mass? 
Well, if C and E have the same mass, but C has a much greater volume, that gives C a lower density, which means one could float and one could sink, even if they have the same mass. So the logic here is that C and E could potentially have the same mass, uh, just because the ch difference in volume allows one to float while one sinks. And that's the, um, the argument there. That is the end of the practice test. That uh, gives you an approximation of how long the actual test will be. And you'll need a calculator, and you'll need to know all the metric prefixes, kilogram, milligram, and so on. Any other conversions like centimeters to inches or miles to kilometers will be given as part of the test. But the metric conversions you need to know yourselves. You need to know scientific notation, significant figures, the rules for rounding, uh, the density formula, how to do um, dimensional analysis to convert between units, whether it's within metrics or between different units, and understand the uh, experimental design and interpret a diagram like this related to density. And the test will be on Wednesday.